Okay, folks, I think we could make a start on tonight's event. This is the second. First of all, I should say welcome to everybody who's joining us tonight and a, a particular thanks to all our speakers for this evening and to Emily, who's going to be chairing the session as well. This is the second of uh, two events that the BSA and Kings run on an annual basis um, to do with the theme of translation. And um, it's our great pleasure to have Emily Pillinger as the chair of the second of these two events. Last week, um, the, the session was on poetry. Emily, um, I'm sure you all know very well, is a senior lecturer in classics and liberal arts. Her research interests are indeed, of course, on music and reception of classics. And it's uh, she's published widely on various themes to do with these areas, but also um, on uh, Greek and Roman fiction about women too. So I won't spend too long taking up your time because I'm sure you're really here to listen to the wise words of wisdom from our panelists. So, so I'll uh, very um, swiftly hand over to Emily with a huge thanks to everybody who's participating here this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, it's really fabulous um, to be here and welcome to everybody who's arriving um, here online. Um, as Rebecca says, this is the second of two online panels, which together form our series that this year is called Translation and the Sonic Worlds of Greek Literature. Um, and I'd like, first of all, to thank our hosts, the British School at Athens. Um, I really just wish I were there in the ever stylish Kolonaki. Um, and um, secondly, the Centre for Hellenic Studies here at King's College London, which continues to forge such strong links with Greece and its history. Um, I hugely enjoyed last week's panel, which was on translation and the sounds of Greek poetry. Um, this was organized by Pavlos Avlamis, and it had some of my favorite translators and scholars, Tim Whitmarsh, Alicia Stallings, and Karen Emmerich. Um, we're talking about how the replication of sound, particularly linguistic sound, plays a role in the translation of ancient and modern Greek poetry. So today, we're moving away from language into a different artistic mode. Um, and the topic of our discussion is translation and the sound of ancient Greek music. Um, aside from theatre, ancient um, performing arts are fields that have seen some fantastic scholarly research, particularly recently, but are generally less well understood than ancient visual arts, architecture, philosophy or literature. Um, and this has to do, I think, with the evanescence, the kind of transience of performance. So performance takes place in the moment um, and before modern recording technology, it leaves behind only the most tantalizing of traces. So in this panel, we're going to explore what we know about ancient Greek music, including the music that would have accompanied ancient Greek poetry. And we're gonna reflect on how and why people have been so eager to reconstruct it. And we're gonna consider how modern music has responded to the challenge of creating something new that still honors ancient soundscapes. So what do we want to hear and feel? And what do we mean when we describe music making as authentic or inauthentic in this particular context? So in order to address some of these issues, I am delighted to introduce three fantastic scholars and musicians um, who've agreed to share their insights with us today. Um, they are remarkable because they all have unique interdisciplinary skills, um, embracing historical research, technical musical knowledge and skill, musical creativity, and above all, I think perhaps most importantly, a rich contemporary cultural awareness that allows them to contextualize the work that they do. So it means that our discussion today can confidently span a huge period of time from Greek antiquity to the present day. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna introduce all three of the speakers in the order in which they're gonna speak, which is broadly speaking chronological. Um, and um, then I will let them 
talk for 10 minutes or so each on their topic. And I think what we will then do is take questions at the very end after everybody has got to speak. Um, something I should emphasize is please, if you have questions, could you please put them in the Q&A section, not in the chat, um, so that we can keep the questions separate and we know where to look for any questions after the talks. So firstly, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tosca Lynch. Um, Tosca is a musician and a classicist with unparalleled expertise in ancient Greek music and who recently co-edited with Eleonora Rocconi, the invaluable handbook to ancient music, the Wiley Blackwell companion to Greek and Roman music. And it is on my desk right here, except that I've blurred my screen, so probably people can't see it. It's a great big tome, um, and it is a Bible to those of us who are less expert in this particular field. And she continues to publish a stream of cutting edge articles, um, on this topic of what ancient music sounded like. And most generously, she regularly updates a fantastic website that is accessible to everybody. And I'll put a link to this in the chat. So anybody who's interested can go and take a look at it and her work. Um, Tosca has held various roles at a range of universities in the UK and in Italy, but I will always associate her work um, with Oxford in particular, because I remember being transfixed by a video that the university made. <laughs> She's looking a bit mortified, but it's wonderful, um, of her conducting an ancient Greek chorus with an Aulos player and everything. Look at all these nods. Everybody loves this video um, in Jesus College Chapel in Oxford. Um, and it was such an incongruent image in some ways um, because, because we've got this choral um, uh, song from ancient Greece in this Christian chapel. But in another way, it made me think really hard about overlapping rituals of religious singing and performance, ancient, medieval and modern. So it's actually a really rich resource. And anybody who hasn't seen that video, I, I strongly recommend it. Next, we're going to hear from Sam Dorf, who is professor of musicology at the University of Dayton in Ohio. Um, I have to say musicologist feels like too reductive a term to describe um, Sam. His 2018 monograph, Performing Antiquity, focuses on the music and dance that was used in performing hypothetical reconstructions of Greek lyric poetry in the early 20th century. But it strays way beyond musicology into the realm of dance studies, performance studies, queer studies, uh, archaeology, classics, and art history. He gave a fabulous talk on the queer songwriting of Maxine Feldman in the 1960s to 70s um, at a conference I organized with a colleague of mine um, who used to be at King's called Miranda Stanion. Um, and the conference was called Amplifying Antiquity, and we're very lucky to have him contributing a chapter to that um, on this subject to the edited volume that I'm hoping will be out fairly soon. Um, so Sam is now working on what he calls extreme early music, um, which is on this contemporary practice of reconstructing the sounds of ancient music and the meaning of claims to authenticity in this context. And he too has shared his work really generously. Um, and I will put a link in the chat as well to his tantalizingly named Ancient Mesopotamian Music, The Politics of Reconstruction and Extreme Early Music, um, which is in an open access journal. So again, anyone who's interested can access that article. And like Tosca, he is also a musician and he is himself a practitioner of early music as a player of the viola da gamba. Um, so yeah, yet another practitioner, somebody who's really engaged in um, that of which he speaks and writes. And then last, but definitely not least, I'm delighted that we've been able to snag Dr. Toby Young to talk with us today. Toby is a highly experienced and versatile composer who's particularly interested in the voice and in questions associated with the delineation of musical genre or with the drawing of boundaries between so-called classical music and so-called pop music. And he also teaches music composition just down the road from me um, here at King's. Um, because he teaches as a professor of composition at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. Um, short of playing you some of his music, I thought the best introduction would actually be to read a clip from his bio, which I think gives a wonderful sense of Toby's incredible range. He looks absolutely horrified, and I will mispronounce 
now some of the names and will reveal my my own amateurishness. But I'm sorry, but I love this description so much. Toby has been commissioned by ensembles and orchestras, including the London Symphony Orchestra, Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, Academy of Ancient Music, and Rambert Dance Company, and has collaborated with pop and jazz artists, including the Rolling Stones, Chase and Status, Duran Duran, Florence Welch, we all know her because her mum used to work here at King's, um, Cano, Snow Ghosts, Moko, and Jacob Banks, really hope I didn't mispronounce any of the artists there, but I think it gives us this wonderful sense of, of Toby's work. Um, and most relevantly for us today is his work as music supervisor for the immersive British theatre company um, Punch Drunk, as well as his wide understanding of music as a cultural phenomenon, from electronic dance music to church choral music. And I'm just going to finish with a little anecdote on that last note. Um, a few weeks ago, my daughter came home from her children's choir humming a song that she said she really loved that they had just learnt. Um, and she said it was called Give Me a River and I didn't know it. So I put it into Spotify, it popped up. And who was the composer? Dr. Toby Young. So that was a really lovely circular um, moment and what a tribute to his versatility there too. Um, so that I hope gives a taste of our remarkable speakers for today. And I think I'm gonna start by inviting Tosca to talk to us. Um, I asked her to tell us a little bit about what we know about how ancient Greek music sounded um, and how we know it. And it's the most massive question um, and quite unfair in some ways, but um, I think she's going to have a go at telling us some <laughs> answer to this question. Thank you, Tosca. Thank you. Thank you for the um, most generous introduction. Um, so I'll try and share my screen. So hopefully... Um, a few slides. Can you see it? Yes. Lovely. Right. So um, many thanks indeed for the excellent introduction. Um, and I hope this talk will do something to um, introduce you to a bit of the evidence we have got. That, uh, you know, it's very different sorts of evidence. But it's a lot more than most people think. Um, so obviously, you already, I think, from the having a look at this slide, can have a sense of the richness and the massive amount of different types of sources we've got to, to draw upon. So um, I can only give you a very kind of broad overview of what you what we, we can use as kinds of sources. But yeah. There we go. So the first um, thing I would say is obviously you have already mentioned this earlier on that um, the ancient concept of music, music care, the art of the muses, was obviously broader than music in the modern sense of the word. Although today I'll focus specifically on on this aspect, um, which is also the aspect I'm, I'm I've been working on the most. So. Um, the first kind of evidence we've got to, to try and recapture some defining aspects of ancient music is musical scores and notation. Um, many people are sometimes surprised to hear then that we, we the Greeks had a fairly sophisticated notation system, which um, covers both melody and rhythm. This is the first such, such system we, we know of in history. Um, earlier musical notation rather focused on the harmonic system or the accompaniment rather uh, that could be used to um, accompany um, songs and hymns um, whereas in in the Greek system we've got um, so melodic profiles and rhythmical profiles as well so it's in a way more precise and closer to our own systems um, we, we've got three different types of sources um, or rather documents the papyri from both the BC and AD eras, which is important because there is a big shift in the systems that were employed. Um, so it's important to have this kind of band that is covered, chronologically speaking. And we've got inscriptions um, and manuscripts as well. The latter category um, in, entails also um, 
um, treatises and one particularly is, is particularly important in connection with the documents which is Olypius's introduction to the art of music which discusses in detail the structure and the signs employed in the in the notation system uh, and this allows us to um, reconstruct in some detail um, the melodic notation system and its evolution over time from a central core of signs and then which was gradually expanded to um, accommodate the needs of practicing musicians and also the their evolving conceptions of um, harmonics and, and the, the scales. This in turn allows us to turn back the documents and um, transcribe them in, in some detail to a degree that is comparable to most other types of early music. So um, the way in which the ancient scores worked is um, captured by the idea of, by the very term that was employed to um, identify musical notation, which is para semantica, by the art of placing signs, semia, alongside lyrics. So basically you've, you had lyrics, but well, obviously only in the case of, of vocal music, but um, otherwise, if you you would, wouldn't have lyrics, obviously. But um, the basic idea is that you get the text, and then um, alongside it, you would put melodic notation signs, which we can transcribe thanks to, thanks to the, the evidence of the musical treatises. And then, in some cases, you would also add uh, rhythmical notation signs, such as in this case, which would um, tell us about the rhythmical delivery, whether it coincided with the structure embedded in the text or not, and also whether the um, different syllables were placed in the upbeat or downbeat. So the, the upbeat is is um, um, marked by a, a, a little dot, a stigma. Um, so by taking all, all of this evidence together, we get we we can transcribe the um, documents in some detail, especially in the case of the Seikilos, which is complete in all respects. Um, then, as I said, we can um, understand a bit better what the the structure of these students wa was, um, thanks to ancient treatises on harmonics, and especially Aristides Quintilianus, and this allowed us to reconstruct different tunings and their evolution in late classical times and the relationship to the two main families of Greek instruments. Um, so alloy on the one hand and lyres, ethrae on the other hand. Um, then other types of sources, including Ptolemy and Porphyry, um, have allowed us to understand how the this system evolved over time and uh, uh, the classical system was transformed um, and turned into the imperial system, which was based on a different key. Um, and the, this evolution is detected in um, later documentary sources, such as the canon diagram, which you can see here. Other kinds of sources allow us to understand a bit better the rhythmical side of things and the character of the different types of rhythms. For instance, the Dokmyx, um, this kind of oblique and complex rhythm, which is attested in the earliest of the extant musical documents, the Orestes Papyrus. Um, so this kind of rhythm was a type of mixed rhythm because it in included um, an iamb and a pin. And we've got a short discussion of the nature of this rhythm in, in Aristides, which is very interesting though, and, and it's perfectly consistent with the character of the scene. So both um, of these feet start from asses, the marked or salient element of the beat. Um, and this, Aristides tells us, was a, a, a feature of rhythms that were particularly felt to be moving or emotional. And also they are irregular, as in they belong to different types of feet and the alternation of ups and downs is, is therefore unequal. Um, which may also added to this character of um, this sense of urgency and passion um, and intensely emotional ethos. 
Um, and also this very complex structure um, allowed composers to play a lot with different variations. Um, for instance, one is actually attested in the very first line of this papyrus. So there was an interplay between different aspects of, of meter and rhythm, which allowed to, to allow them to create um, tensions and variations within this very, very complex structure. Um, obviously, equally important insights into the character and nature uh, or, and cultural value of different types of music. Um, this kind of insights are offered by um, philosophical and literary sources, which include a wealth of references to music making and their social and cultural and aesthetic implications, um, which obviously had, especially in, in lyric and comic poetry, you have um, also their performance, which is um, the metrical patterns of these compositions formed the backbone or the, the skeleton of, of their rhythmical delivery. And therefore their contrasting characters allow us to understand and increase and deepen our appreciation of the interplay between different voices in drama and myth, for example. Um, likewise, philosophical or rhetorical works preserve key evidence about ancient music theory and practice and the cultural values and significance of different types of musical performances and the role they played in key historical debates, for instance, the new music in classical Athens. I've done quite a bit of work on Plato and um, the way in which music is plays a key role um, in, in Plato's dialogues and um, how his references to musical matters are not at all decorative or theoretical, purely theoretical, but rather um, how his um, use of musical concepts is deeply shaped by classical harmonic theory, as well as musical practice, and how these ideas in turn play crucial roles in the dialogues, shaping central points of his philosophical projects, including the definition of temperance and justice in the Republic, as well as the harmonic construction of the cosmic soul, the Temet Tamius. Um, in addition to all this, there's a fourth and extremely important category of, of, of evidence, which is that of archaeological finds and reconstructions. And lots of excellent work has been done on this front over the last 10 years or so by teams of scholars and instrument makers. And thanks to that, thanks to that effort, we can now um, access and use accurate replicas of different types of ancient instruments, including the elven lyre, for instance, as well as professional kitharai and tall lyres that were typical of um, Eastern Greek music, that we call barbitoi, um, as well as various types of instruments, including different kinds of alloy. So these are two kinds of mechanical and fairly complex instruments have been reconstructed in recent years. Um, and as well as flutes. And as you can see, there is a variety of diff the different types of sources and context in which these kind of instruments were employed. And um, in addition to physical replicas, we can now also create virtual um, 3D models of ancient instruments so as to try and make them available to a broader audience. On this slide, you can see a model of the Louvre owls that I created um, a, few, a few years ago. And an interactive version of this model is available on my website um, and is augmented by music played by an excellent audit on a modern replica of this instrument. As you can see here, this model includes a reconstruction of the missing mouthpieces of these pipes, um, which were played in pairs with double reeds. Hence, alloy were not flutes, so um, please help me <laughs> spread this piece of information. This um, translation is obviously very common, but is actually misleading because it's a completely different kind of instrument um, and was used in very different context. uh, but contexts. Um, flutes were open pipes and were played in individually, whereas alloy were closed pipes uh, or were played in pairs. So a completely different kind of world, really. Um, 
As you can see, the, the, the model I constructed matches the relevant iconography very closely. And these are two examples preserved at the British Museum. And the scale produced by this model likewise corresponds to well-known ancient keys and modes, including the Phrygia mode was, that was typically associated with this instrument and the relaxed and fe festive Iastian mode which is, of course, obviously um, appropriate for the sympatic setting as represented in, in on the vase. And here is an extract uh, that I, from the, the video that was mentioned earlier. Um, well, this is, was, it was a performance that, was, that took place, um, this bit was at the Ishmaelia Museum, um, and is a piece by Athenaeus, a paean that um, is extremely complex and illustrates the chromatic bends in, bendings and play that were typical of the new music. Uh, we will not listen to it now, but um, if you choose to listen to the performance on the website, please be kind uh, and keep in mind that we had a grand total of three rehearsals before the concert. So it's really um, just the starting point, really. Um, but it gives me a chance to address briefly the issue of authenticity uh, which is going to be central in this conversation, I think. Um, so on the one hand, I hope uh, I've shown that we've got quite a bit of evidence that we can draw upon um, to reconstruct different aspects of ancient Greek musical performances and their um, significance and character, especially with regard to tunings and instruments. So in a way, uh, we are in a similar position to what happens with other, other types of mu early music. On the other hand, there are um, different kinds of limitations, which include limitations of particular settings, for instance, um, the number and gender of musicians and singers, as in this case, um, as well as other known unknowns, so to speak. For instance, tempo is a big unknown factor, um, even though we can um, make informed choices on the, on the basis of the rhythmical treatises I mentioned earlier and the emotional impact of different rhythms. And obviously tempo var varies significantly also in, um, in modern performances. So this in a way may be less of an issue than we, we can imagine. The bigger issue is choreography, which is obviously a big unknown, um, especially given that we don't think, I don't think we have, we've got any um, technical treatises on dance, um, but many scholars are working and have been working on, on Greek and Roman dance in recent years and are coming up with very interesting insights, so we may be in a better position in the future. And another important limitation is that we are not part of a living tradition and therefore cannot access ancient music schools or professional training in any way. Uh, these are obviously key elements and a key, key environments in which Musicians absorb very important information that is often in, in all of or a form, and therefore we cannot really access it. Um, and this lack of professional training makes it hard for us to assess the full capabilities of ancient instruments, especially in the case of complex chromatic instruments, such as some of the alloy I, I showed earlier, or many stringed kithari. In the sense, we um, sometimes we can draw interesting comparisons with other ethnomusicological contexts, but um, which must be handled with great caution, but can also offer helpful correctives to some of our, our preconceptions about what is natural or possible in musical terms and some related biases we perhaps unconsciously project on ancient sources. So, um, I hope that um, this very short introduction has given you a sense of the um, richness of the sort of evidence we can draw upon and that um, this can be a starting point for our conversation, um, which I very much look forward to. Thank you so much, Tosca. That is revelatory. Um, <laughs> I really love this, the way you had the overlapping pipes the alloy in such a way you can see that the holes in the in the drawing 
actually map up to the treatises to where those notes would be kind of mapped out in the treatise. I don't know if I understood that quite correctly. I may have got that wrong. Sorry if I'm misrepresenting it. But I just love this idea of this layering of the different source material, um, kind of allowing us backing up what we are learning from one source material and seeing it in another area. And so the mind boggles the possibility of 3D printing of our own alloy so that we can all have a go at home um, is so brilliant. Um, it just kind of really spreads this practice that much further. Um, it's wonderful. I also kind of like this idea of ancient technical training. It suddenly made me think it's like the ancient guild hall. We should be getting Toby in to kind of give us more <laughs> Indeed. conservatories in the ancient world. But there we go. <laughs> um, there's um, impact work for the guild hall to do. Um, thank you so much, Oscar. I will I will hand over to Sam now to um, tell us a bit more about different kinds of reconstructions that have taken place and, and the kind of cultures around them, if that's all right. Mute myself. Unmuting myself would be the first step, right? <laughs> uh, okay, I think we're good. All right, so hopefully you can see my screen. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for everyone for coming, and thank you so much again for all the hosts um, uh, for putting this together. So uh, as Emily mentioned, um, in 2018, I published a book on the technologies and networks of exchange that fueled the imagination and uh, performance of ancient Greek music in early 20th century France. In the lead up uh, to the book's release, my editor and the marketing team at Oxford University Press encouraged me, as they encourage all authors, uh, to promote the book online on my social media and within my local networks. So I tweeted, right, as one did in 2018, I tweeted expecting to see a parade of heart emojis and high fives and hand clapping from my musicological and dance studies colleagues. And I was really surprised that my tweets with the hashtag performing antiquity were also receiving attention from this little known corner of the early music making world. These musicians, some professional, some amateur, found me on the site, formerly known as Twitter, on Facebook, on academia.edu, through their own interest in the performance and reimagination of ancient Greek musical cultures today. As these contemporary practitioners of what I've been calling extreme early music found use for my research and Twitter handle, I too have learned from them online. And so today I wanna to talk a bit about the music these mostly amateur musicians make. And this is part of a larger book project on extreme early music, which um, my kids tell me I have to say extreme early music. Um, and there's a special attention today on the online networks that, uh, that these individuals have created to translate their newfound knowledge to general publics operating at the margins of a number of academic disciplines and musical traditions, these musicians are not just playing extreme early music, but often do it in marginalized spaces of the internet. At least they seem like margins to many of us who sit in the perch of the academy, and that these translate readily to mainstream consumption. So first, what is extreme early music and how does it differ from regular early music? Scholarship concerning the performance of early music and the historically informed performance practice that might happen at Guildhall and other uh, conservatories, uh, these movements are usually limited to the notated European music traditions ranging from that thousand year period from about 800 to 1800 uh, AD or CE when the most active activity concerning music from uh, a 250 year sweet spot, 1500 to 1750. Our narratives of music history and historical performance practice often skim over the earliest traces of human music making from prehistory to the introduction of Christian chant notation at the dawn of the middle ages. And I see two main reasons for this. One, people either don't care or they think it's too hard. Early music performers and scholars uh, like Colin Lawson and Robin Stowell inadvertently summed up the we just don't care argument quite well uh, in the, histori the historical performance of music and introduction, uh, a handbook, uh, when they described their work as part of a project to quote, develop 
a comprehensive theory of performance covering music from the earliest times we care about up to the present. So in 1999, when they wrote this book, they said the quiet part out loud. Most historically informed musical performance practice only cares about some old music, not all. And clearly, pre-Christian European music is not something many care about. Many don't care because we've always assumed in musicology and performance um, that we just didn't have enough material to properly play music of the earliest human civilizations. Some things, uh, something like scholars like Tosca brilliantly just showed now, um, other and, 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 and many like Tosca have just consistently been disproving that like we do have some evidence. Uh, and that assumption is just really predicated on the idea that in order to properly or authentically reconstruct ancient music, we need to rely on ancient sources alone. And that combining authentic ancient methods with anachronistic modern ones produces inauthentic performances. A number of scholars and performer scholars are seeking to rectify this uh, by reimagining and performing music based upon ancient sources combined with novel and modern performance techniques and styles. But how do they do it? Uh, I like to compare the work of these extreme early music musicians to the 1993 film Jurassic Park, when scientists brought dinosaurs back to life by filling in the gaps of the recovered ancient dinosaur DNA with modern frog DNA. What's the worst that could happen, right? Like the popularity of the Jurassic Park music uh, movie franchise, musical reimagination, performance, discovery, and reconstruction of early music or extreme early music play to our interests in being there, in experiencing the past anew, like living history projects, battle reenactments, and CGI-fueled dinosaur movie adventures, the performance of a reconstruction may create in the public a sense of being there or of time collapsing. As performance studies scholar Rebecca Schneider has written, however, it's not just about touching time. She writes, reenactors also engage in this activity as a way of accessing what they feel the documentary evidence upon which they rely misses. That is live experience. Many American Civil War reenactors fight not only to get it right as it was, but to get it right as it will be in the future of the archive to which they see themselves contributing. Schneider's argument is strikingly similar to that of musicologist Richard Taruskin, who in responding to the explosion of creative approaches to performing music of the past uh, that began in the middle of the last century, he offered it a new way out of the performative problems of authenticity. Um, and he writes that for performers, their job is to discover, as Taruskin writes, um, if they are lucky, via es eigentlich uns gefällt, right? how, it, how it feels, right? Uh, how we really like it rather than how it really was. And that can draw upon a number of varying authenticities. A composer's intentions are both unknowable and not always ideal guides to authentic performance in the present. However, the current methods of historically informed performance practice for music only work for the musical repertoires and traditions we are familiar with, that we actually care about. When applied to extreme early music, especially in the cases of musical cultures where far fewer materials exist, musical authenticity that relies on an adherence to a composer's intentions, original instruments, and historical treatises is impossible. There just isn't enough information. Without enough information on ancient Greek lyre playing, repertoire, etc., for example, why bother trying to perform it at all? We will never be able to get anywhere close to what they did 2,500 years ago. Their work will never be considered authentic to many, and many of them know it. Regardless, these musicians persist. In my interviews with and observations of musicians who work within this sphere, feeling, experimentation, and play only curtailed by a few limitations based on historical materials, modes, or languages, produce creative works that try to get at what ancient music might feel like rather than what it might have really sounded like. And for this very reason, many of the musicians I've been working with are viewed as uninformed. 
University colleagues of mine have politely listened to some of these uh, musicians' experiments and compositions and said something to the effect of, well, that's nice, but it didn't really sound like that. At the extremes of what one can call early music, many of these musicians have developed networks and communities outside traditional early music and academic circles in exclusively online spaces. As extreme early music practitioners, they're often cut off from the traditional intellectual venues where music, performance, authenticity, and reconstruction occur. Many of these individuals do not have affiliations with universities, let alone wealthy ones. The internet, on the other hand, has been a far more productive and collaborative space to showcase their work. Lacking institutional support and also free from the economies of tenure, these musicians gravitate to online uh, platforms to distribute their music. Um, Facebook groups, X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, YouTube, uh, and the for-profit peer repository, academic repository, academia.edu. Many of these online platforms are ideally suited to help explore the questions that are, they are interested in pursuing. For example, extreme early music practitioners are often more interested in using experimental techniques to discover how an instrument might be constructed than use experimental techniques to determine what a player might be able to do with it. One Facebook group uh, affectionately nicknamed the Old Liars Club uh, by some members, but technically called the Liar Historical Features, um, features all sorts of players, both professional and amateur, sharing videos of their playing, tutorials on building, amplifying, tuning, and more. Um, here in this slide, we see an amateur builder not only sharing their homemade lyre, but also receiving tips from seasoned luthiers and professional musicians. Um, including the Canadian personality Peter Pringle, who's a regular on the site. Ancient Greek lyre players will also sometimes engage with the remaining scraps of musical notation from ancient Greece, as Tosca talked about. Perhaps the most popular of these uh, lyre players is a man by the name of Michael Levy, uh, a musician living in Chepstow, a small town in Wales, whose YouTube videos featuring him playing modern replicas of ancient Greek lyres have over 7 million views. His Spotify streams are similarly impressive. If you just Google ancient Greek music, the first thing you hit is Levy's videos with an astounding 2.3 million views for one of them. Uh, for comparison, the average YouTube video typically never exceeds 10,000 views, ever. Uh, when he's not recording liar music and posting it online, he does janitorial work. In 2019, he told me in an interview, quote, I do cleaning jobs by day and am Orpheus by night. He records all of his music from his spare bedroom. He's collaborated with Rufus Wainwright and Jeff Coombs, and his music is continually featured in um, to accompany museum displays at the British Museum, Royal Ontario Museum, and more. He even had his lyre music license for a television advertisement uh, for M&Ms, as you can see, and the video game Apotheosis, the Hellenistic Age. And I'm just going to share a clip from uh, a fan play streaming uh, gameplay from this game, just so you can hear his music in the background as this person uh, explores antiquity through this video game. You install a few mods and uh, CK3 looking a lot better. I've transported myself to, is this ancient Greece? I, I guess it is. It's uh, Greece from a long time ago. The return of Dino Stalinopolis from Greece. It, we're all we're all ready for this, right? Greek Stan, he's back. Okay. He's back. So all told, Levy is particularly proud of his success, noting that thanks to the internet, more people have heard his lyre playing today than anyone ever did of any single person in the ancient world. And this is all without a lived tradition, as Tosca noted. As an ancient lyre player, he's entirely self-taught. Levy writes clearly on his website and has also told me in our interviews that his music is not a reconstruction, but rather a recreation. Reconstruction, he explains, is not particularly useful for his audiences. Musical projects that seek to reconstruct ancient music based on ancient source materials alone in inevitably leave gaps. Recreation, he says, means filling in those gaps, like in Jurassic Park. He fills in those gaps by composing and improvising entirely new works that are, in his words, historically inspired rather than historically informed. 
Inspiration for Levy comes from many places, an existing melody, a particularly resonant recording of other heart music with lots of reverb, a video he saw online, a comment by Peter Pringle, a costume he wore, and often his own imagination. Rarely does the most successful and prolific performer of extreme early music rely on the historical sources. Another Greek lyre practitioner shared that in post-production of her own lyre playing, she often adds reverb before posting online to connote both an open space as well as a sense of intimacy, even though she acknowledges that in outdoor theaters, lyres don't sound like that. On the internet, it doesn't matter. As translator Jenny Croft recently said in an interview for the New York Times, quote, translators overwrite originals, making texts in other languages visible and invisible at once. Without translators, literary traditions and even languages might rot in isolation. With translators, the literary ecosystem keeps up the diversity it needs in order to flourish. Like literary translators, these musical translators are helping tend a rich and verdant space for a greatly needed musical creativity to reimagine the, and perform this past. They compose over, across, and through the existing sources, weaving them into something new. So obviously, some people do care about extreme early music, but the individuals who do are often at the margins of our disciplines, and the internet is often the only arena to connect, support, learn, and showcase. Welcoming these experimental and creative practices of extreme early music uh, from uh, exclusive online spaces and past the guarded gates of our academic spaces has the potential to usher in fresh perspectives, new creative energies for performers and scholars alike. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, I, I Do you know what I love about this is that I, I'm on a mission to rehabilitate the word amateur in, yeah. in professional university spaces. And um, because I think anybody who does interdisciplinary work will feel like an amateur. And it's an, it's an extension of the imposter syndrome that mm -hmm. everybody has. But I think that amateurism is something that, you know, is 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 it's really important to think about what does it mean to be to call oneself an amateur and and i i think this idea about what do we care about what what the amateurs do is 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 something explicitly that they care about um so this this that that quotation from Tereskin, you know like how we really like it um is 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 what we're looking for um and i have a question i'd love us all to come back for maybe to maybe at the very end but my question is 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 partly is music really what we perform more than what we want to listen to or what we want we wish we could be performing and in some cases for those of us you know that have some musical training um we get a very different response as performers um to a piece than than we do as listeners um and obviously listening is also participatory in its own way and it's all musicking um but i'd love to come back to this idea of how important that participation is and how the digital space also facilitates that so loads to think about thank you so much um, I think it's time to bring in Toby, who is, if any of us is, is actually actively involved in, in making music, it's Toby. So I will, I will hand over to you, um, to, um, help us through these questions of how one approaches the job of actually composing music, um, that is associated with a specific historical story or time period. I mean, there's so much already to, to kind of chew over, isn't there? Um, I'm just going to try and work out if you can see my screen as a slideshow. Can you see it as a slideshow or is it a... A slideshow, yes. Good. Uh... Um, yeah, I mean, all of these questions are stuck around my head and it, in some ways it's lovely going last, some ways it's horrible because there's so many things that I want to respond to that I, I kind of, <laughs> I think I shouldn't respond to quite yet. I guess uh, if we're kind of carrying this thread on, um, I'd like to be a bit of a... Of a provocateur shall we say and sort of push uh, some of these ideas even further and if we're thinking about that Taruskin quote of how we really like it what does that really mean for us so we've kind of already said that we might not fully know in a sort of embodied epistemological sense what it actually feels like to experience musical performance or to, to hear this music in the context of um, being in ancient Greece and I guess as a composer I'm really 
interested in kind of engaged with what the terms of translation might look like. Um, Sam had a lovely line somewhere about the people he's looking at, that their music, their ideas translate readily into mainstream culture through the internet. And I think that that kind of makes me uh, sort of stop and kind of question, what does that mean? What are the limits of it? Um, are we thinking about kind of technical elements? Are we thinking about aesthetics of antiquity was a, a phrase that I think he, he alludes to as well. Um, what are our hierarchy of values in what that translation looks like? You know, we're we trying to think about um, purely the kind of sonic experience uh, or the technical elements of that. Is this about emotional registers or haptic uh, registers and, and kind of deep meaning? I, I'm thinking of, for example, the idea that, uh, you know, things that were once deemed incredibly dissonant, like uh, the tritone interval or whatever, that were seen as something abhorrent that would make you physically be uh, kind of repulsed and now very common day. And so what does it mean to think about changing sort of subjectivities of listening in these discussions and what it might feel like to us now? Um, I wanted to kind of come slightly sideways to this through uh, sort of a little very, very light touch potted history of some of the uh, the kind of, I guess, the, the history of engaging with, in the lightest possible way, insp inspiration of Greekness, of ancient Greekness in uh, opera music theatre to lead me up to some work I did recently um, with a the theatre company that Emily mentioned. Um, and to kind of think about what the difference of, of Greekness has meant as a sort of set of aesthetic influences versus um, technical rules or kind of uh, very specific provocations to, uh, to music makers and theatre makers. Um, I would say that there's a particularly interesting starting point, which is that uh, interwar modernism in music um, sees, and this is a very, very kind of grand narrative, which we can unpick later, but sees composers uh, after kind of tonality has sort of collapsed um, and, you know, the war, the first wars uh, brought sort of disarray to the world, trying to kind of find ways to bring order back to their music through various different kinds of forms of formalism. Uh, and one of the ones that we see really uh, being taken up by a lot of composers is a kind of uh, narrativic conventional, the kind of formalism of um, sort of Greek tr structure and rules. Um, and I will play you a quick example of, of one of those. This is an excerpt from uh, Michael Tippett's opera, King Priam. I think I've got enough examples and I think I'm going to try and stick to my 10 minutes. Um, what I think is really interesting about this is that it very much doesn't sound like ancient music in many ways. It sounds, I think, still fairly modern in its own kind of way. Um, this is from the 50s, I think. But there, there are lots of techniques that are trying to be employed in kind of homage to um, Greek sort of theatrical and musical practices. So this kind of narration and reciting being uh, reinterpreted like his operatic recitative, but still with the kithara as the kind of the instrument behind it. Um, and there's also, a, in other bits of the opera, quite a lot of um, the kind of the Greek rhythms that Tosca was talking about present. So um, really the thing that catches our ear is the fact that it uses a, a dissonance in a strange way it's not sounding like Greek modes, but it does have other qualities of it. And so this is what I was kind of alluding to before about, about hierarchies of values. Um, this comes out of a performance practice of sort of Brechtian alienation that you try and have that kind of distance. So that's a very modern technique, but Tippett translates the idea of this sort of the formality and the, the kind of the recitation as this kind of um, separated thing with moral weight as being something that's dissonant and strange to our harmonically and that is the thing that I think stays with us listen to it it also of course adds a kind of historification it enables us to be slightly emotionally detached from it and to develop a sort of response in that way um, but also then there's another kind of trope in a lot of the work around this time of um, ancientness as a sort of uh, I guess, in, invoking a kind of moral weight, this idea that an ancient moralizing quality might be maybe semiotically sort of triangulated within uh, sort of austerity and grandeur and, and Greekness, and this kind of thing sort of um, comes together. Um, in terms of uh, the, the kind of the big trends in sort of Greek musical sounds in opera, uh, one big one is corporeality and the chorus in various forms, sort of declamation of, of a group of voices, um, the kind of the rhythmic, you know, the prosody, that sort of thing, um, as it also is attached to to physical embodiment and that kind of performance. And I'm sure a lot of you know these sort of examples. This is, um, I think it's 
I think it's a Peter Hall production. It's an Oedipus Rex from the National Theatre. What message comes to famous thieves from the Golden House? What message of disaster from that sweet-throated Zeus? What foul thing that our fathers saw do the seasons bring? Or what that no man ever saw? What new monstrous thing? Trembling in every limb I raise my loud, importunate cry, and in a sacred terror wait. So I, I suspect plenty of people on this call can tell me much more about this than I can. But this this sort of style of, uh, I, I don't know how authentic it is. I'm not in any ways you can probably hear interested in authenticity in, in this discussion. Uh, we can discuss that later, Emily. But this kind of style becomes something that's very inspirational to a lot of composers who are trying to take this and add music onto it. So rather than thinking about kind of Greek music, thinking about the musicality of the, these performance practices. Um, the, the most uh, sort of famous or infamous is um, Harrison Burtwistle, who was the music director at the National Theatre when he was doing a lot of these productions and really took a lot of this work to heart and his entire career was making effectively operas out of these kind of performance idioms or rules or practices. So um, again, the kind of Greek poetic rhythms, um, but in a similar way to uh, Michael Tippett, thinking about what um, sort of dissonance and viscerality could look like or could be like as sort of, um, yeah, modernizing, if you like, some of the kind of performance practices of theatre, some of the kind of ideas of opera and spectacle, those sort of things. Uh, I'm going to briefly play you an excerpt from his opera, The Minotaur, which you can probably imagine the story of. So I guess my first sort of central provocation, if you like, is what might a sonic transliteration as opposed to a translation sort of sound like or look like? Um, you can probably hear that there are some elements of uh, kind of prosody and Greek chorus within the actual operatic chorus. There are lots of uh, sort of technical transliterations of uh, specific kind of rules and systems of um, particularly uh, rhythmic ones. But Burt Whistle's clearly doing something very different. It sounds quite intense, quite modern, with the idea that it's supposed to invoke the feeling of, of intensity and to invoke um, the kind of the spirit of this very, you know, kind of emotionally wrought and dramatic scene. So the kind of question of, of an old rule and system that might be used to write the music to kind of divide some of the rhythmic structures or even harmonic structures within the, the sort of syntactical functions of Greek, uh, Greek kind of, um, music making, if you like, but with a very different aesthetic effect for a modern audience to feel um, kind of uncompromising and confronting all of those sort of things. A sort of similar but slightly different angle comes from Mark Anthony Turnage, uh, who worked on a retelling of the Oedipus myth called Greek, um, which was with a contemporary sort of interpretation, I think it's called a verse play by Stephen Burkhoff. And there unfortunately aren't very good recordings of this, but I wanted to play you this opening. So I found a sort of Slightly grainy ones. I hope you'll forgive me for the quality of this. <laughs> Assemble. 
Emily's now thinking, why on earth did we invite this guy to present at a very uh, illustrious session? So what I think is very interesting about this is that Turnage um, very much kind of takes a light touch approach to authenticity, but thinks a lot more about what happens when you take some of these practices. And I'm thinking of here, it's mostly rhythmic um, as a sort of compositional musicality. Um, and what happens if you take away all of the superficial uh, signifiers of antiquity, but you try and make it completely directly relevant to contemporary society. So in this case, the whole opera is built around sort of chanting and rhythms, but instead of it being um, Greek rhythms or, or, or prosody, it's all football chant. So you can probably hear the Arsenal chant at the beginning, um, but still with various kind of uh, austerity in the timbre of it. So lots of use of percussion. And I know that uh, with Tosca we'll have a conversation about whether percussion and drums is, is really a valuable thing here. But I think it's really interesting to think about what is gained and what is lost by um, kind of this, this sort of very radical uh, kind of re-signification, reinterpretation. Um, this leads us up to uh, work that I've been doing recently that I've, that I've really enjoyed. Um, so this is the theatre kind of called Punch Drunk and we do immersive performances. So we build, literally build the world um, in these kind of vast uh, air, airplane hangar style buildings and the audience walk through the world and encounter performers in front of them. And you can see uh, on the right here, the audience wear masks, um, which are designed to sort of um, make them feel like they're part of the set, I guess, to make them anonymous. And then the performers here on the left uh, are very much kind of at the heart of the action. This recent show called The Burnt City was a, a retelling of, it was sort of two stories at once. It had a kind of Euripidean Hecuba in one space and the, the Agamemnon Iphigenia uh, sacrifice story in another one. Um, and we had uh, the lovely Emma Cole was our, our uh, sort of, I guess advisor, she became so much more than that, she's a dramaturg slash uh, advisor. And what we found really interesting is what happens when you kind of push this as far as you can? What what levels of mediation do you need to add to the mythology, but also the, the practice of telling these stories through, through musical and theatrical ways to bring the myth to life, but also to add a viscerality that would be um, impactful and engaging in a, an embodied way and in a cultural way or in a modern audience? And what do you have to do to uh, sort of, um, yeah, bring that to bear. I'm gonna play you a little tiny, just kind of glimpse of what it, a lot of the sound world was like in the various different spaces you walked around. This is sort of, uh, I guess, a kind of coming together of various different languages that we found helpful in trying to tell these stories. Um, one is a, is a kind of filmic music sounds, which uh, might involve musical tropes and like, for example, lots of drones and that kind of thing, um, but also maybe Foley sounds, a sort of sound design as well. Uh, I think I'm kind of manipulating samples of instruments and actually a lot of the work um, I did was taking samples of uh, various actually things off YouTube a lot, in fact some of Tosca's stuff, uh, to kind of inspire creating new sounds through synths for example, so uh, you know what would an owl loss sound like if it were recreated with synthesizers and does it matter that it's not an owl anymore and that kind of thing. Um, I'll play just a little bit of this, this sort of underscore So the provocation for me as a composer then becomes what elements do I need to, to recreate a world and to feel like I have a connection with the world authentically or not, but also what elements um, might be expected or viscerally and powerful or um, kind of communicative in a semiotic way to a, a modern audience to help tell the story. For example, you know, in that, 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 that particular uh, example, kind of the drums, the visceral primitive sort of harmonic sounds but also the sort of ritualistic um, kind of repetition of this material. All of these things are ways that I can make an audience feel in a certain way, feel like there's a kind of, um, uh, yeah, sort of antiquity-esque quality to the world, but very much being still modern in character. Um, and particularly drums come into this a lot, but also uh, sort of playing around with, with sort of modern subjectivities and expectations around what, um, dramatic music should be versus what it might have been then and so we lent into a lot of uh, sort of things like sci-fi music and other things just to add add these other kind of reference points I'm going to play quickly 
just a bit of a trailer so you can see some of the more kind of upbeat music that ended up going in the show. there before it tries to sell you a ticket for a show that doesn't exist anymore. So I guess this is my, my second big provocation, which is within the context of modern expectations, modern listening subjectivities, uh, sort of post-structuralist even subjectivities, what does it actually mean for us to reimagine this music? Are we trying to make music that is technically accurate? Or are we trying to get people to feel like ancient Greeks might have felt listening to it? Are we trying to um, think about this music as abstract? Are we thinking about its deep entanglement with other kinds of performance practices, sonic feelings, social functions and rituals, and how might, uh, say for example, bring in um, kind of modern signifiers of antiquity relate to technical aesthetic uh, ideas of um, sort of authenticity that we've heard about. So I would love that to be a thing we discuss, but anything we discuss, I'm sure will be fascinating with this amazing collection of people we have here. Oh, thank you so much, Toby. I have. Yeah, I you I what I love is you brought Turnage and Tippett and 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 these are you know British guys that brought Greece to London and beyond. So I I kind of like I feel like that's particularly appropriate for tonight's discussion between Athens and 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 London plus some um, um and all our audience who are coming from all over. So yeah. <clears throat> um and actually but that particularly made me think about a much broader question that I don't know if we'll have time to tackle. But this is the question of geographical translation. Um, and it made I thought about it with Turnage because I think what's so interesting about the play, um, but also the opera, is the way in which the Cockney um, tones become part of the sonic system. And as you say, you talked about football riffs. There's lots of like funny little adverts. There's the nice one, Cyril, nice one, son. <laughs> like, kind of, like pops up, but it's nice one, Oedipus, basically. Um, and there's lots of jokey bits in it that I think are part of exactly what you're describing, this, this kind of uh, different kinds of translation. But that geographical translation struck me. I'm so sorry, I'm, I, I'm going to hand over to other people to ask questions, but just one thing I wanted to bring out from that that really struck me is that filmic soundtrack that you created has a vibe that I think because as, as modern listeners and watchers with our own film knowledge, makes us think of much broader landscapes, right? You, you look at a film and you think of outdoors and, and there was the sounds of kind of winds, that, that kind of electronic hissing sound that's, that are, that's a little bit like the sounds of nature. It made me think of Bettina, the, li the lyre player, adding reverb to her lyre to kind of create this sense of space. And I think it just reminded me of a recent um, scholar of Greek tragedy, um, Emanuela Bacola at Warwick, who has thought a lot about tragedy and its location in landscape, the way in which ancient tragedy is in a space where you can look out beyond the theatre to the countryside beyond and how now, you know, as we think more and more about our role in the world, music that makes us, that kind of expands that sense of, of the stage and, and, and opens it up so that we have a broader sense of where the action takes place um, within this kind of a broader landscape, a broader sonic evocation of the winds and the waves and 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 the world outside, um, the way that you did it through that kind of film filmic sound as well as those kind of natural sounds and those synthesized sounds um, is really brilliant. Um, and you more and you talked about foley as well, so that idea of you know you just could, again using all these techniques that we have. Um, I just read a really grotesque article about Foley in Saltburn, so I've got that. I'm thinking about it particularly at the moment. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, so thank you three so much. There's a lot of overlap and a lot of ways in which this conversation could go. I think what I will start off with is a lovely question um, from Benedict Lanaras in the um, Q&A, who asks, if this, and I'm guessing this is ancient Greek um, music. If this is extreme early music, what is the music of prehistoric times? That is Bronze Age music, Neolithic or Paleolithic 
what do we get to call that? Um, and I guess I guess it is an interesting question about the kind of layers that um, we create. Um, does anybody want to have a go at that? Sam, would you like to have a go at this since it was it's your coinage? Sure. Um, so the book I'm writing, the, there's a chapter on, on that too, right? Like the ways in which we reimagine and perform um, these experiments with the earliest traces. So like, you know, 40,000 year old bone flutes that are um, using similar 3D technology that Tosca talked about, right? Reconstructed. Um, but there's like, again, no living tradition. Um, and the people that are doing experimental music with this is they're, they're new musicians, right? Like they're, they're, they're more comfortable, like, playing, you know, um, the music of the last 40 years than they are uh, even music from 200 years ago, right? Uh, and they're the they're the ones um, who are who are explore, exploring this music, which so I would also call it extreme early music. But that's just me. It's worth checking out that there's a whole research project, there's something like that, European Music Archaeology Project, like that. Um, and they they I think were great at, as you say, and bring lots of composers in. I'm always really interested with this kind of thing of, um, you know, what do we want to recreate? Is it just the sonic quality? And the reason I mentioned performance practice at the end is if we, so in ethnomusicology, if you look at, you know, the way that music is used as kind of performance versus embedded in rituals where it's not sort of music, but rather the way that people gather or can commune with a god or can engage with each other in around childbirth or something, you know. So understanding these things as, as both objects of sonic value, but also of community value. And I think I'm picking that is always quite an interesting one. Absolutely. I wonder if we can go back to this question and, and I should say, please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A. Um, uh, but as people are thinking, it's quite hard to type a question. If you'd like to, um, uh, Greek music, oh, right, Benedict, sorry, is talking about how Greek music goes back before the fourth century BCE. Um, of, yeah, I, I mean, are you thinking maybe also about oral composition, about epic? Um, uh, I, will, I will let Benedict follow up on that. Um, I'm going to pause my question because I've had plenty of time to talk and I'm going to ask Bela Kamenz's question here. Um, <clears throat> do you encounter ancient music practitioners who came to it without modern musical trainings? And what are the pros and cons of coming to this field with technical modern training or without it? That's a really interesting question, I think. Um, who would like to have a go at that? <laughs> Tosca, would you like to, is it, would it be helpful for you to engage? Because I think that you bring such expertise to this field. Um, do you have a sense well, of how I, to engage without the expertise? I don't think I've ever met anybody who came to this particular um, kind of practice without any kind of musical training at all. Um, so um, that's an interesting question, especially in terms of how would people learn to, uh, learn music and music, musical, acquire musical training without written kind of notes or wrote, you know, because part of the earlier tradition that um, Benedict was referring to is hard for us to, we, we do have traces and um, a few hints, um, but they're, they're all recorded around the fifth and fourth century BC. So it's, it's already kind of removed from that. And we can reconstruct a bit of, of the um, basic features of earlier types of performance, but it is harder. And it, the, the degree of uncertainty widens significantly as far as I know. Um, but yeah, it's interesting to think about perhaps looking at other kinds of folk traditions would help us to understand, and also other ethnomusicological parallels would help us understand a bit more how people would learn and would acquire musical training with it would you know, through different means yeah interesting question hmm. can i ask a relevant question to tosca i was really interested when you're talking about the three rehearsals before the performance and i guess uh, yeah i mean yes. i don't want to i don't want to bring back some trauma for you but <laughs> thinking about so for example um i don't know like in uh, a lot of I'm going to say Indian classical music, I'm particularly thinking about Hindustani music, this idea of um, sort of the, the, the real value is the stuff in between the notes. And so you might learn the, the notes quite quickly, but then you spend a lot of time with the guru, understand the very subtle kind of ways, like bend <laughs> into it and out yeah. and all those sort of things. And I guess I'm wondering sort of when you're teaching or engaging a new choir with this, what 
what elements of their classical, I assume, training do you rely on to just be a kind of base level? And what sort of extra elements of, of difference in performance practice do you have to, to bring in or kind of invoke in them? Mm, that's a very good question. Um, on that particular occasion, we did really have a lot of time to get to these kind of um, finer details. Um, and also another part of the video um, shows me um, conducting with very powerful kind of gestures, which I wouldn't normally choose. But um, yeah, it was kind of necessary <laughs> to you know help people get to the end of it. And um, yeah, that video is going to follow me until, I don't know, retirement or something, which is interesting. Anyway, um, <laughs> the, um, the harder bit of that particular piece of Athenaios was um, engaging with the chromatic um, section um, in the middle, which was actually, um, it, it's very hard to, even learning the notes is not that easy. Um, and interestingly, the ancients had the same kind of reaction to it and they were rather puzzled by those kinds of modulations and some of the kind of more conservative intellectuals reacted very strongly against it, precisely because you, it kind of pushed the expectations beyond and also it kind of modified the structure of the tunings that were familiar to the kind of classical uh, audiences so um yeah it's it, in a way it is on this respect and also other bits uh, that you mentioned earlier um it's actually closer than we might think the the kind of framework of reference that people brought to the um experience of ancient music and how those kind of expectations were um reversed or you know played with rather um so yeah it's an interesting area to explore i think in terms of recomposition or new compositions that play with those contrasts thank you can i jump in oh sorry sam you had a moment go go for it and then yeah. i'm just gonna follow up with the next question because i think it's okay. related no because um i had a similar question i was wondering you know if tasca could talk so yeah, i think you talked a little bit about like in, or mentioned that we don't have like ancient conservatories today right um but as someone who spends too much time online uh talking with and, and learning from <laughs> musicians who are amateurs who are who are just sort of figuring it out on, on their own one thing that you know they many of them are, are seeking is like a tradition right like they want method books you know and your your website is a fantastic right um resource for so many of them when they chat with me but i, I was wondering if you can like if we could dream like what would be like if if someone was to major you know in lyre playing or aulus playing today like what would their curriculum be like how much like would we start with theory would we start with you know mechanics um you know how much would be improvisation and creation how much would be you know, learning to reproduce um the work of your of your um your you know the, the past um, that's a very, very good question, and um, I think I'll have to think about it a bit more. Uh, people have asked me, um, not exactly this question, but um, a bit about how to learn this kind of music from a kind of more practical point of view, and hopefully we'll be able to offer something in the future. Um, but um, hmm, I guess, given that so much, especially in Alice playing, a lot depends on what the... Um, musician is thinking and how how you conceptualize different intervals so it's i think impossible to separate completely the um kind of practical training from the um uh, kind of theoretical level um i'm not sure and also obviously there's a kind of um, unconscious element to it which is obviously we cannot control but uh, there is a lot we can do in terms of imagining how the sound is supposed to, you know, look like and sound like. Um, and there is a lot of evidence in the treatises um, about the shape or the uh, whether the sound is warm or you know or dry or something. So there's a lot to play with in that area, and we can sometimes um, identify the technical counterpart to it. So, um, so different kind of ideas in terms of um, images. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of of um, work and exploration to be done there. In terms of lyre playing, we we are starting from I think more solid ground because um, Ptolemy gives us fairly detailed um, descriptions 
um, of the of how the um, most common tuning systems uh, kind of especially also including the fine tuning so uh, of different modes so there is a lot a lot to to do there and um, yeah and in the future I hope to to be able to show a bit more how that relates to to the um, musical documents we've got so yeah there's lots of to, to be to, to to be done there and to explore together with musicians who want to um, try and revive this tradition you know I've got <clears throat> a couple of interventions here that I think might be helpful from the chat um um so um Baylor comments writes that for today there is now a degree program in the ancient Greek lyre in Athens I'm sure Sam at least has encountered this. Um, I did not know this, so that is fascinating. And I'd love to know more about, is this at the University of Athens? Is yeah, it... I think that, uh, I don't know where it is, but like Nikos Zantoulis, he used to be the, um, he was the former like uh, principal trumpet player for the Greek National Opera. Um, he's uh, switched from trumpet to lyre, right? And he's actually published uh, a variety of like method books uh, and resources um, that help um, people who are interested in sort of learning a quite a virtuosic lyre playing technique uh, far above my uh, ability level. Um, but, you know, he's a virtuosic musician. And so he's he's developing a methodology for other musicians who want a conservatory style with like exercises and things like that. Um, it's like, it, it's very reminiscent of the kinds of like method books I had as a, uh, as a young clarinet player or viol player. Uh, and it, it feels like it's a conservatory type education, which is super cool. Fascinating how this conversation is almost is, is, is becoming a kind of sociological study of 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 this um mm -hmm. you know the the relationship between the amateur and the professional and the education systems that we work through as um in music and classics. Um, I have something, I, or are you, go, are you going course to you can, time? Of course you time? Can. Then we'll quickly get to some of these questions, and then um, yeah. Well, go it's, ahead. Just, it's just on that. I, I guess I'm miles off the mark, but how much of this is about technical skill as a musician, and how much of this is about music as a way of expressing other things? Like, for example, would you really have had to have learned physics and maths to understand the you know the kind of the musical the spheres or whatever to be able to get into it? And so, what value is doing this as an abstract kind of technical thing? versus as part of a holistic way of seeing the world or holistic education? Yeah, that's a great question for all of music, right? Like, do you really need to know who Bach was to be able to be a good cello player today? Well, I think particularly with this this kind yeah. of <laughs> conversation, right? But I, I mean, for me, I would say you don't need to know because there's enough stuff on the internet. Like people people are, are there's, there's enough inspiration um, that, um, and for many of these musicians, musicians they they really don't care right like uh if it's authentic or not for others they really do care quite a bit um so I, I, yeah it can go either way i'm going to jump in with the question i'm sorry for the questioners i'm going to do this in the wrong order but be just because a question from lorna windsor maybe more of a reflection um is directly relates to this and she says since ancient greeks had no institutional music training is it necessary really to understand it? And would a more instinctive approach be more effective in performance? I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of, been, I was also thinking about the Parry Lord work on Homer that was so central to thinking about oral composition in the 20th century, where it's looking at folk traditions, where, and, um, and that kind of apprenticeship in a particular kind of performance that revolutionized how we think about that text. So, um, but yeah, I, I I wonder if this is maybe something that we can play in. What 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 is an instinctive approach? I mean, I think this well, is an interesting question, isn't it? Sorry, Tosca. No, the, one thing is that um, I may have given the wrong impression with my my comments earlier on. The Greeks had institutional musical training. Um, it's we don't have access to it, so that's kind of a problem. Um, uh, they they had a fairly elaborate. Um, music kind of musical training systems and um you know it, it took lots of years several years of dedicated um study to to be to become you know, a professional so that's the problem rather is that we don't really we we hear only um echoes through written sources of what they were doing so that's kind of the problem um 
the instinctive approach is interesting. Um, and also the idea of what is effective in performance. Again, we there is lots lots we are bringing into those ideas. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll leave that to to others. But I just wanted to um, clarify that I, I I you know I, I hope I haven't given the wrong impression. Yeah, <laughs> that's Oscar. I mean, I'm also thinking about there's work done by people like. Andromachi Karanika uh, on women's folk songs. You know, this. I, there are lots of different traditions, of course, in antiquity, and there is no one. So there will be formal training in some contexts, but of course, we've got women's. We've got we've got enslaved people who are almost <laughs> sure to have had their own musical traditions and songs. And and of course, a lot of these ancient cities are very multicultural, and people are coming from all over. So which actually takes us to David McIntosh's question, I think. Although I'm thinking in geographical terms, but he's got an important historical question, which again, we touched on briefly. Thank you all for a wonderful talk. With that, can I ask Toby, I, but I think this is actually a question for all of you, if we can identify trends and styles in the same way as hairstyles, was there a grunge age or a rock in ancient Greece? And I think, I mean, I was thinking Tosca, what Tosca was saying about the new music, there's definitely traditions, but I don't know if anybody wants to weigh in on this. Well, in many ways, the, the um, um, critiques that were raised against the new musicians are really kind of similar to um, to what we hear in you know twentieth century music. Um, so it's it's rather stunning that kind of you know strong reaction against innovation and against um, especially um, chromatic kind of explorations. Um, I'll just stop there and let others um, contribute. Well, I'm still thinking about this idea of effective in performance and what that means when translating. You know, if we have something that we know was really antagonistic and people thought was really disgusting and dirty or very kind of <laughs> complex, whatever it was, what happens when we put in performance and it actually sounds like it's quite pleasant and old? What does that mean? How do we make it feel like it's got that grunginess to make a modern audience engage with it? Or is that not important? And is that not something we should be doing? Yeah, and this is, you know, the, the, the critiques that so many... In, in my field of musicology have had it with ancient music. It's like they, they said, well, there's so little of the actual music. You have to fill it in with all these other things. Right. And I make the Jurassic Park joke, but, and I, and I sort of made this sort of like offhand comment, like um, what's the worst that could happen, but it's those things that you fill in, right? Like how, how do I make it sound rough and angry um, that we start to see, especially online critiques that get into national politics that get into, you know, questions of gender and, um, and, and bias against female musicians. Like, oh, I can really hear the voice of Sappho in you. And I'm like, why, you know, like, so like people, people want to like put, overlay right or uh, or um just as we saw the aulos the 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 3d aulos over the ancient image right that that idea of translation is that jenny says is like writing over um like we have to write over it's fun to write over but when other people are like when we see the the people who are writing then their identities get get tied in and we hear critiques like oh well you brought in some you know west african core playing into your lyre playing well that's not authentic right there's no way our great european western tradition could have um this influence and you start to see racist you know uh you know ways in which uh this mu this contemporary music is uh received as well which i i find really fascinating too this is yeah it's really interesting isn't it i i think it's going back to that question of how culturally specific is music and the emotion that music creates and and then and yet you know, and I think more and more with the turn to cognitive sciences and neuroscience, we're also saying there are kind of universalities in how brains are wired. There are certain things that, you know, you, that there's been such a revision of what does what is religion? It, is everybody kind of hardwired to have a kind of faith um, as opposed to arguments that all religion is culturally specific? So these are these are such interesting, really big questions, but you're seeing them actually bubbling up to the surface in terms of the pref practice, which is so great. I'm going to finish with the last question, which is, again, um, a, a kind of comment as well, but I, I know we're going to have to bring things um, to an end soon. Stelius Saroudakis says, in classical music, we know both composition and performance styles, therefore we can approach the music adequately. In ancient Hellenic music, we only have the scores, composition style, but ignore the performance style. We therefore, seems to me, 
feel free to pick up a replica of an ancient instrument and do with it what we like. We project ourselves onto it and that's fine too. Um, it's an interesting idea, isn't it? It's playing into this, that first th thoughts about performance as a kind of transient um, mode, but I don't know if anybody wants to finish. Okay. I'm glad that Celius is, um, has joined us. He's a, a great colleague of ours and he's done wonderful work in reconstructing um, ancient instruments, especially. So he, he knows very well what he's talking about. Um, and he's also performed lots of different um, scores and ancient music in different contexts. So it's great to have him. Um, he's right in saying that there is a lot that we bring into um, performing ancient music, obviously. On the other hand, as he knows very well, we we have a lot of kind of information about that kind of limits. If we, if we, if the, let's say, if the goal is trying to um, get as close as possible to what might have been, you know, the, the Greek version of things. Now we've got quite a lot of information we can try and, and make our choices kind of principled in a way um, and show, you know, the basis for our choices. Um, on the other hand, as he says, um, an imaginative engagement with what we know um, of ancient traditions is equally um, creative and and also productive. I guess what seems to be important is we need to be clear about what we're doing. Uh, both things are equally valid and interesting and um, and beautiful in many ways. Um, but the thing is, we, we shouldn't try and, we should be clear about what we're trying to do. You know, obviously the birth of opera itself, you know, was kind of created out of a desire to try and reproduce ancient music, which obviously wasn't, you know, um, it doesn't sound anything like it, but um, but it, it, it kind of shows the um, um, creativity that is engaged, uh, that is um, kind of, um, ignited by the idea of trying to um, relate to the Greeks and, and their world. So I guess that, that's something I wanted to say, that um, both things are equally valid, but we just need to be you know, aware and, and clear with our audiences about what we're trying to do. Thank you, Tosca. I feel like we are going to um, have to leave it. And I think that's a really lovely and helpful kind of summary to, to leave it on. I think we've seen this kind of full spectrum of different responses to um, ancient music. Um, and I, I feel like there are lots of really buzzwords that I wanna follow up, even the idea of immersion, you know, what kind of immersive experiences are we talking about here? Um, I've felt totally immersed in in the expertise on offer here. Um, I, I feel like I've come out learning so much and I'm really, really grateful to these amazing speakers for sharing their expertise so willingly and freely with us all. Um, I've put a couple of links in the chat, um, but I think I will just um, bid everyone farewell, say a big thank you again to the BSA and to Kings, to our fantastic speakers, to the audience um, for coming and listening and coming up with these great questions and just being so kind of, um, enthusiastic about this kind of somewhat arcane field, but really it's not arcane at all. As as um, Sam was showing, huge, huge numbers of people actually engaging with the bigger questions that it brings up and, and responding to this material. So um, it's been an absolute privilege to, to, to be involved in this. And I'm very grateful to you all for getting involved. And thank you very much, Emily, to you for all your amazing hosting and uh, pulling everything together as well. Thank you all very much for your contributions. It's been fascinating.